Okay, so I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Um, we all love tomatoes, and of course, they are not one of the easiest things to grow. Um, we actually are more challenged than most places because we have cool nights. And tomatoes are a tropical and they don't like cool nights. So the one that really is a scourge for us, the really hard one, is late blight, Phytophthora infestans. And that's the one that turns the plants black. And then there's white stuff on the other side of the leaf and that's the actual spores and sporulating. And that is not present here except on volunteer potatoes. And it's the one that causes us the most trouble. It comes in with the cold, with the, with the wind, but it doesn't take until cold, wet weather. And that's the one that caused the Irish potato famine. And the whole part, all of Europe lost their potato, potatoes and tomatoes, but the Irish, because of the way the British um, was, were ruling them and exploiting them, only ate potatoes. And I'll tell you that story a little bit more later. Anyway, the reason they had such a hard time, if all of Europe lost it, but they lost it really quick, is because they, like us, are a cool, moist place. You know, and so that's why we have it so rough, you know, why we get the disease so off. So, so much more than, I mean, I came across the state um, on vacation last year and stopped at farmer's markets and talked to my buddies. And they all said worst year ever. I mean, it was a terrible year last year, right? Anybody disagree about that? I mean, as far as how much rain we had, it was pretty impossible, right? But we were talking tomato disease and they still hadn't had late blight with all that rain because the nights were never cool enough for it to come in. You know, so it's our cool nights that cause it to happen. And that's why it happened in Ireland. The other kind of diseases, we have them. They're much easier to manage. That's the irony of it. I mean, they were asking me about disease control. All I was talking about was late blight. They finally said, Pat, we don't get late blight. And I was like, oh, you guys got it made. You know, because the rest of them are actually pretty easy to manage organically. Usually, there are moments it's harder. I had one year where I couldn't get a grip on late blight, I mean, early blight, not because we don't have the fungicides that work well with it, but because the weather was so misty that we couldn't get our stuff to stay on it and it kept coming back, you know. But also sanitation really helps with that a lot too. It's not like late blight, which has to come up from the south unless you have volunteer potatoes. All your neighbors have volunteer potatoes. Volunteer potatoes seem like a gift, but they are the Trojan horse of tomato diseases, you know. So much as they're tempting, brand new disease-free potatoes every year would give us much less late blight trouble, you know. So we're gonna cover those two diseases are the main diseases that I think we have here. Other problems that are pretty common that we can quickly, easily solve are things like splitting and blossom end rot. Those are actually pretty easy. I didn't even put bugs on here. Bugs are real easy with tomatoes, except for one, and that's the stink bug. Anybody having stink bug problems? The new marmated stink bug? We're really lucky, where's the wood? We're really lucky. For some reason, it hasn't hit us. West Asheville, Fairview, all kinds of places, just swarms of them. They come in the house, to the new house pest. It's a true bug, looks like a squash bug, but there's white on the antennas and white on the sides, just little white markings. If you see that bug, kill it. <laughs> you don't want it to build up. The problem it does is it masses on things and it doesn't really damage the production but it actually damages the fruit to where everywhere where it's fed on it, there are these hard grainy cells that are no fun to eat and tomatoes don't look good. So it's, it's a pest that I fear we will see. We haven't so far right in this area, you know, and that's really good. Anyway, that's what we're here to talk about is tomatoes. We're gonna talk about the diseases we have and then the methods we use to control them. And the outline will give you a pretty good idea of how we're gonna be covering it. Um, We'll do some touring. I'm waiting on Marshall Hagen. He makes our compost tea. Um, I hope he's gonna make it here. He may not come through for me because we've been trying forever to get this new farm worked and it keeps being like we we're gonna borrow some local farmer's equipment. It keeps being that it's either too wet um, or they're using the equipment because it's been so wet that they need to use the equipment. And finally, just today, he got hold of the disc. And he said, Pat, I'm on the, I'm on the tractor. I'll come over for a half hour at 6.30. Let's see if he makes it. But if he doesn't, I can, I can fill him for him. I really wanted him to be here, though, because he actually does 99% of the spraying. Um, he's real adept with the sprayer. He has been a conventional tomato grower. 
I'm not real adept with the big, the big 100 gallon sprayer. I can do it, but I don't like it very much. I'm real adept with a little powered backpack sprayer, but I hate that. It's really no fun to use at all. Um, and so Marshall's into it, and I got other things to do, so he's been doing the actual spraying, but we talked together about what the, ro the rotation of fungicides is that we use. And I've actually laid them all out there. I found everything in our cabinet except for the Serenade, which is good news because Serenade is no, no, not going to surprise anybody. If you walk into almost any garden center right now, it's probably the most widely used biological fungicide out there. Some of these other ones, more esoteric. I've got some places where you can get them on here. But the bad news is, how many people here are commercial growers? Okay. Good news for you is that they're readily available at CPS. Do you go to CPS? No. You're in luck. You want to start going there. CPS. Yeah. What is that? It's, the, it's crop. It's on, the, it's on the thing, too. The phone number's there. Crop production systems. It's services. Services, rather. I'm sorry. Services. Yeah. Services. Yeah. Um, they're just like, there's lots of other people on here that, that sell stuff. Um, but as Marshall said when he looked at the price we were paying for Serenade, he said, they're real proud of their Serenade. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, they're asking a lot more than they charge at crop production system, services, rather, you know. And so it's just, because they're selling to large-scale farmers who are buying acres and acres worth, their price is better on what they have. The downside is you cannot trust them at all if you're trying to be organic to know what you can use. They'll flat out tell you, yes, it meets NOP, and then you go in there and talk to them and look at it, and there's no way it meets NOP. I've had to take, I had one time left an event I really wanted to be at just to get this on a Saturday, so I'd have it. And I bought it, and then I finally realized I'm looking and looking, and even though they told me it met NOP, everybody know what I say, when I, what I mean when I say NOP? I'm sorry. National Organic Program. So if you're a home gardener, maybe you don't need to worry about this, but if you want to grow in a way that is not poisonous and is sustainable, then trying to follow what the, what the professionals follow, which is either OMRI approved, right, which is Organic Material Review in Institute, that's actually a, a, an organization, a nonprofit that is paid by people who sell things we use to do the, the vetting for you so that you don't have to figure out if, it's, if it meets the National Organic Program. They do it for you, you know. So it's a way you see OMRI approved, and whenever somebody pays to get OMRI approved, it's right on the front. They're bragging about it because they paid for it, and it's a way for you to quickly go right to what you want. If you're getting other stuff, you have to actually do the research yourself and see if it meets NOP. And they, they just hadn't done that, and it didn't meet it, and I couldn't buy the stuff from them. It was really a big pain. I spent 45 minutes missing an event I wanted to miss trying to get it, and it was the wrong thing. So be careful. Make sure that you're getting what you want, if you want it. If you don't care, it's not a problem. They got, they got the stuff, you know, and it's not going to be impossible if it's something like copper sulfate, you know. They have regalia, which we're going to talk about, and serenade, and oxidate, and they don't have the copper sulfate we want. So the ones that I know of that we're going to talk about that we, we, we use here and that meet NOP and that we feel fine about using are those three. And all three of those are much cheaper than we can get anywhere else. Can we get the copper sulfate at Southern Ag? Because I buy a lot of stuff Maybe. I'm going to show you, the, the, there's a few out there that are allowed. One's called Nordex, and we'll probably sell that to anybody who wants to buy it, but I'll warn you ahead of time, we hate it. And it's not that it doesn't work. It sure does kill the disease, but it darn near gets the tomatoes, too. They really look bad after it. They really hurt from it. It's just really harsh um, in our experience. And maybe somebody from Nordex will see this and call me up and say, you just don't know how to use it, and I gotta teach you how to use it, because you're, but if they do, that's great, you know? We tried to follow the directions, and we had bad results. We got one particular Champ brand of copper sulfate, and they brought the bag out so you can see it. And that one, not all, that's what happened at CPS. They had Champ, but they didn't have the one I was looking for, you know? And so the other ones don't meet NOP, but that one does, you know? So that's why I say be careful, you know? Um, anyway, that's the intent of it. I think we'll just get started. Um, and, you know, maybe we should just go sit down because I'm going to first talk to you for a little bit about the resources. Then I think we'll go out and actually look at stuff while we talk about the rest of it. But so you can write, you know, more about the resources. Let's just go sit down for a few minutes, okay? I already talked about CPS. Um, they're down near World of Clothing. If you call them up, they'll tell you how to get to them. You know, I'll give you the address and you can use your um, phone if you want. 
fifth season is in Asheville. There um, probably started out as a, 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 a store that was serving hydroponics people pretty exclusively. But they've now moved because they see the, um, the, the vacuum in the market into selling stuff for organic growers. And they have a lot of the stuff that we want. Um, they are considerably more expensive than CPS. CPS, it's simply got to do with their market. They're not selling nearly enough volume. It's not that they're trying to gouge people. They just don't have the same volume that CPS has, you know. So if you can buy from the people who have the volume. The hard part is that a lot of the things that we use, if you're going to use them as home gardeners, what you need to do is get together before you leave tonight, buy them together and divide them. Because they only come in these big containers. They're just not aimed at small growers, you know. But you can do that. Just do some, and you can do it here if you want. We can have another event, you know. You can't, they, stores cannot do that. They need a special license and a big facility. But homeowners can. Individuals can do it, you know. You can actually get together, break it down. I mean, if, you, if we did it here, we would actually, you know, help you to do it in a way that I think would make the regulators really smile. They don't like it. They still won't like it. They don't want it to happen. But they can't stop home, like, small-time people from doing it. What we do is we print up the material safety data sheets and give them to you, you know, and make sure you can even buy them from us that nobody had any containers that had food labels on them. That's a big no-no. Never put a pesticide in a food yeah. label container. That's a way to kill someone, you know, some kid or something like that, you know. Um, and these are all, you know, perfectly fine for organic. That doesn't mean they're harmless, you know. There's a reason why they work. They just won't do the damage to the environment or us that the other things will. You know, so fifth season has a lot of good stuff. They also have a whole lot of stuff in the realm of what I say is the number one thing you start with is to make sure your soil's healthy and your plants healthy. That's number one for controlling diseases. Okay, um, so that's one of my favorite sources. If they don't have it, Seven Springs Farm Supply is actually has more small sizes and um, has pretty comprehensive supply. I actually can pass around, uh, we'll take a break at some point, and I can pass around their catalog, I have it in there. Um, and they're up in Virginia and they ship, and the shipping will kill you if you're getting a big size. But they actually, if you contact them and get on their mailing list, they actually put together truckloads and drop them off at places like the Hendersonville Food Co-op, the Madison County um, Extension, I'm sure they have a drop off in, in Asheville, but I never go to that one, so I don't know. So they have, you know, they come about three or four times a year and they'll send you an email and say, we're taking orders till this date, and it'll be there three or four days later. So it arrives, and you go to pick it up. And then what would it cost you, 25 bucks to get like a bag of alfalfa meal or something that's organic, just sort of shipping, will be a couple of bucks because it's just a big truckload. You know, you're not paying the UPS, the UPS rates. So they're actually a pretty good resource that way. Um, and then we have Doug Robertson. We all know about him now. Um, he, once again, is serving farmers, so he's not going to have small sizes. But once again, you can break it up, you know. Um, and he did have the copper that we like to use. And then the Organic Grower School, they're not a supplier, but they do have a trade show. And so you can access a lot of stuff and find a lot of resources at their trade show. And if you are into growing tomatoes or anything in this area, and you want to grow them without a lot of pesticides and sustainably, this event is for you. It's one of the, they're actually having a fall one, which I forgot to mention. Um, and I'm going to be presenting at it on growing winter vegetables. It's on the 5th and 6th of September. Um, but they're big. Their flagship event is in the spring, and it happens when UNCA has spring break. So that's usually like the weekend of the 7th or something like that. And they have like 2,000 people at that event. And it's like 70-some workshops and a huge trade show. And it's just fun. It's fun to be with that many people that are into the same kind of growing that we're into. You know, it's really... At UNCA, University of, uh, of North Carolina at Asheville. It's actually real. If you haven't been there, it's really easy to get to. And they're very well organized. It works really, really well. Um, and they have really high quality classes. It's a pretty, pretty great event. Um, they also have a new, you know, get, go online. It's like www.organicgrowersschool.com, I think, or maybe .org. Make sure you get both S's in there, growers and school. And sign up and tell them you want to get their emails because they have a, Regular um, email newsletter that gives you tips on growing and stuff, tells you about other events. It's really a great organization. And I will admit, I used to be on the um, steering committee, so I'm a little prejudiced, but I speak there pretty often. But 
I think I'm not not too prejudiced. I think it's pretty true. I think don't you think it's a great event? It is great, and and it's on our resources page. That link as well. Right. In case you want yep. to go there. Yeah. It is a great event. Very yeah. inspiring. Yeah. And then the next one is our website. You know, a lot of you have been there, but loads of um, good good stuff there, including a six-hour version of this class, which is about disease control. You know, I, I go into, into it much more detailed than here. Talk about a lot more diseases. Talk about you know the same principles. Some things have changed. It's always evolving. If you're organic growers, you know, um, we'll get into that as we're looking at um, the outline. All right, and then because we use compost tea as a significant part of our biocontrol. Um, I put some compost tea resources down there. And the first one is McEnroe Compost. And that's McEnroe Farm in um, New York. Um, the resource right below, I hope I'm going to help him to get stay in business. And pretty, I hope that eventually we'll no longer be talking about McEnroe because his stuff will be as good as McEnroe's. Right now, if you want to make compost tea and you haven't made really good compost, one thing you can do is let compost age not being rained on, right? Kind of in a shady place where it doesn't bake too much. But once you've made it, let it age for a year and then it'll be fine, right? But if you've made not so good compost, if you didn't turn it and keep it hot, you don't want to make tea out of it because it's likely to have things in there that aren't going to be good for your plants or at least won't be real positive. They may be bad, but they may only be not real positive. Yeah. Mushroom compost is real plentiful out here. Yeah, it's, it's got a few things wrong with it. For one thing, because mushrooms right have their own defense systems mm -hmm. you're not going to have as much life in it okay. you know and oftentimes it's not very finished mm -hmm. it's pretty unfinished you can try it because sometimes c disease control happens because of using an unfinished compost mm -hmm. but i would try it i would i would make just a small amount you know and i'll give a real brief description we have it on the web page so you can see how to do it but i'll give a brief description of how you can make the aerated kind of compost see we talk about for like less than fifty dollars, getting stuff at a pet store, you know. Um, I wouldn't even make five gallons though. The first time with mushroom compost, I'd make as few as you could, maybe two or three, and spray it on some plants that you just, you know, you're okay if, if you lose lose something. Mm. See what it does, you know. The McEnroe is pricier and harder to get. It is at fifth season, um, and um, Seven Springs carries it too. Mm, but stuff. it's very reliable. You know, it wasn't last year. They, they kind of fell on their face last year. They had some problems and it was terrible, but they've come back. Yeah. You know, we let them know that they messed up and they came back, yeah. you know. So it's really good compost. Um, but Waste Stream Innovations, the next resource, they're right down here on 191. And they um, have old compost now. And it's, it's actually, I think, too woody. I don't recommend it for putting vegetables on. But for compost tea, it's fine. You'll have a lot of good fungi because of that. So if it's, if it's the good age stuff, it's been sitting there for a year or something, it should be a very good deal. And you can just go ahead and get a scoop of that and put it under a tree and um, cover it and have that for your compost tea and it'll be fine, you know. Um, and then Charlie Clark, okay, so food web. If you need more information than I'm going to give you about compost tea or than we have on the web page, so food web is the source, okay. www.sofoodweb.com, I'm pretty sure. But if you just punch in Soil Food Web and stay with Soil Food Web, don't let them try to lead you astray like they always do, you know, with some ads up top that are similar. But follow Soil Food Web. You'll find them. I'm pretty sure that their vendor, because they have a, a compost tea manual that if you really get into compost tea, I recommend. And their vendor is a company called Earth Fortress. But you'll find that from the, um, when you look at that too, you know, when you go to it. Okay, and then um, the last one is, or last two, Charlie Clark. Charlie Clark makes really good compost tea for golf, co golf courses. Oh. If you put in Charlie Clark golf course compost tea, you'll get them. It's pricey. He only sells these big units for like 60 or 110 gallon units. But you could buy one and break them up. And it makes really good tea. Um, it's disease resistant. I guess I didn't make the best call in the rain. But that's okay. We can do talk talking until it stops raining. It'll be good. Yeah, yeah, right. Positive thinking. Pardon? Positive thinking. I yeah, love it. yeah, right. Um, we were going to try and spray compost tea out tonight, but then we figured we'd just show you how to make it instead. Okay, so Charlie Clark, if you want to buy really high-end compost for compost tea, his is pretty amazing. By the way, not germane to this subject because we don't have um, insects that really attack tomatoes. I mean, flea beetles will bother them a little bit in the springtime, 
but you can actually get from him in the springtime a compost tea bag that has nematodes in it, beneficial nematodes, that will give you control of all those kinds of soil pests like flea beetles, cutworms, and stuff like that. Uh, it's, that doesn't always work because of soil conditions and temperature. But when it works, you feel like you died and went to heaven because you don't have flea beetles, you don't have cutworms, you don't have Japanese beetles coming out of your soil. They'll still come in from your neighbors, but you do get control. This was not supposed to happen. <laughs> are there windows up on that truck? Yeah, they are. Good. Because I didn't. Anybody need to put their windows up? Everybody good? Okay. All right. All right. What is the control for the flea beetles? It is beneficial nematodes. Beneficial nematodes, and you can try them other ways. We've had the most success getting them from Charlie Clark in the compost tea. And we think that's because they're going into the ground with their microbial community. And things work better when they're with what they're, you know, what they're used to. They don't work as well when they have to be on their own, you know. Um, like you'll do a lot better in your own neighborhood than you will in New York City probably. It's kind of the similar principle. Unless you come from New York City, I might have that wrong. But, you know, I don't, I don't do that well in New York City. Um, okay. So the principles. The principles are actually pretty straightforward. Um, and I wanted to be out there showing you stuff, but we'll go out there and look at, the, at things afterwards. The number one principle is pay absolute attention to maximize soil health, okay? And key to that is letting nature do what it does. The more you disturb the soil, the harder it is to have healthy soil. So nowadays, and this may be a little strange to folks, but nowadays the cutting edge of growing is not working the soil. It's time to park your tiller. It's time to park your tiller. Now, I don't mean that you have to like try and grow on a lawn because that ain't going to work too good, you know. But once you have your soil ready, then try not to work it. And there's all kinds of techniques like that. And we have videos that will show you that. Uh, on a small scale, you can do what farmers are doing now, which is no-till. You can grow cover crops and then kill them and plant through them. And your plants do way better because there's no place in nature the plants are doing well where the soil gets worked up all the time. You know, nature's busy building this incredible network of life, this network of fungal hyphae, right? The, the very fine white strands from fungi that are holding the soil together and building it up and actually bringing nutrients to the plants and actually making no room for the pathogens that are in the soil. So trying not to work your soil is a major way to improve it. Growing cover crop, yes. So all those additives that I put in every year and mix into the soil is not what I should be doing. Um, you're doing okay. I mean, it's good that you're feeding the soil another way, but you're spending money and not doing as elegant a job as the microbes will do, you know? And I'm not going to say not to use those, but instead of putting them over the whole garden and using a tiller and all that, try doing no-till, making a planting mix with some good compost and putting a little bit, much less, because the compost makes it much more readily available and you can overdo it really easily, a little bit of everything you use now in that hole. And the plants will get that for a start and then they'll be booming and they'll make friends with the life in the soil and you'll start getting happy plants, you know? So that, and, and you'll see that all of a sudden your soil's gonna start getting better because when we till it up, we're actually breaking down all the work that the life is doing to make it good, <laughs> you know? So that's the number one thing right there. Grow cover crops, don't try not, and actually, I'm embarrassed because I have been trying to get the fabric up and our cover crops down forever because our strategy is to lay fabric till we suppress the weeds and our plants get bigger and then we try not to have the soil bare or dead. We try to come in and sow cover crops underneath our bigger plants. And I love doing that and I'm so frustrated I haven't got to do it yet, you know. And I'm even more frustrated because it's raining again and I want them to grow, you know. But sometime in the next couple days, everywhere you see fabric is going to be gone and we're going to have a mix, actually, of summer and fall cover crops planted there. And then eventually, the summer cover crops will kill out and the fall cover crops will take over and dominate. And if we need to, we'll come back and overseed a little bit more fall cover crop. And this, is, this approach is becoming more and more advanced all the time. Now there's a man, Ray Archuleta, who we should be hearing from tomorrow, I hope, for our new farm. He's planting nine varieties of cover crops at a time. He's doing this. And you can find them easy on the, inter on the internet. If you just punch in Ray Archuleta, cover crop combinations or something like that, he'll show up. There's great YouTube videos. He's doing this in a way that conventional farmers are not using nitrogen 
and getting yields like they never had before. Because a basic rule to soil health and garden health, why do we have all the flowers out there right now? Partly because we love them, because they're gorgeous and they make us happy, right? But also because that diversity creates the balance that controls bugs. The same thing works in the soil. If you have great diversity, you have much more fertile soil, more life, more dynamic life, things work better. So we're now up to maybe four or five cover crops. We're about to make the jump to 10 with Ray Archer let us help, you know? And he actually is in Greensboro, he's close. So he's, he comes and speaks at a lot of talks. He's already agreed to come here. Next year, we're gonna have him come here. We're gonna have our, those mixes growing. We're gonna have him come here and talk about it, look at what we've accomplished, look at where we haven't had it. He, He's going to have a baseline because we test it with his lab, the lab that he likes. So this new farm, he's going to have seen it from, we just bought it from a, a woman who was renting it to conventional tomato growers who have grown nothing but tomatoes on it for five years and not put a single cover crop on it. It is not in good shape. But we're going to show what you can do by just using cover crops. We'll use a little bit of compost, but it's 40 acres. That's a lot of compost, you know. <laughs> you know. With his method, is he, is he working the soil, working the cover crops back into the soil? He's trying not to. He's to you, know, you, you do it when you need to. Like right now, when I said Marsha was out there on the disc boy, his plan is like nine passes. I just shake when I, that just makes me, my blood runs cold when I think of nine passes. But the soil has been like bad. The field's not crowned right. There are all these beds in it that are a mess. And so he's going to try and get it back to a shape that we can have. And then we're going to take a big loss. Every time you work the soil, you lose organic matter. So we're going backwards, but then we're going to put compost down with these cover crops and we'll start to see a pretty rapid improvement, you know. So it's not like, you know, one of the other people, and we have him on the web too, Dr. Ron Morris. He was actually one of the major scientists that taught conventional growers how to do no-till. And he now, in his retirement, is teaching low-till organic. And he doesn't say no-till because if you grow organically, you can't use herbicides and sooner or later, the nasty weeds that won't go away with our, our, our techniques have to be tilled out, you know? And so those are things like mugwort, Johnson grass, nut sedge, things like that, you know? We got some solutions for that, but once in a while you do need to till. But if you till every few years instead of three times a year, your soil is gonna be way better, you know? And so there are techniques, and we have videos about that. I can't go into it in detail now, but essentially the easy way is you grow cover crops that are close to death when you want to use want to use the space anyways. For example, in the springtime, you grow things like rye and vetch, or crimson clover and barley. And then when they're going to seed, all their energy is in their tops, and they're easy as all heck to kill. You knock them over and they die. Try to kill them in, in March or April, and you could turn them under, one little bit of green shows, and they'll grow back completely. But once they're going to seed, they're easy to kill. So that's one of the easy ways. The other thing you do is you grow summer cover crops and you let the frost kill them. And they can plant things like garlic and things like that, you know? You could also plant things like spring barley, which Seven Springs Farm Supply carries, and it kills reliably at 17 degrees. So you could put that in in the fall, make sure you get it in early, get a big lush growth. It freezes out sometime December or January, and you have a nice cover for your spring planting. So those are the kind of no-till strategies, you know? The other thing is try to use good compost. And folks, you don't need tons of compost. The compost is a catalyst, you know? So if you're gonna work the soil, always work compost in because that's one of the few times you're gonna work the soil. Otherwise though, you lay it down before you knock that dead cover, that cover crop that you're killing down so it covers the compost and you let the life work it in, you know? You also use small amounts in a planting mix. So you're getting the life right there at the roots so they get a good start, you know? Um, another example of soil health, um, we actually work with, uh, a for-profit company, Chargrow, and we've been using their um, Chargrow Original, which is like incredibly expensive. It's like $200 a bag, but seven pounds to the acre has been giving increased yields on the first two pickings of Mountain Fresh Tomatoes for like seven years of trials with Dr. Ron Morris. And at the um, apex of that effect, which he won't talk about because scientists don't want, they call it an anomaly, but I know what happened. They had an 80% increase in yield one time. You get that as a, as, a, as, a, as a commercial grower and you just paid down your tractor. You just aced your mortgage for two years. You know, it's a major thing to get that kind of increase. Plus, these are, this production is precocious. 
it comes in early. And that's, you know, in general, char helps things to be early. We don't know why, but it just tends to cause precocious fruiting. So that's great. I'm actually talking about that, though, not to make, the, make a sales pitch for that, but to talk about the effect of using things like charcoal, which have that life in there, and the inoculating effect. And what made me think of it was the compost on its own will do that, too. The charcoal is just more powerful. It gets you more, more of an effect. Literally, all that the farmers do when they get that kind of yield is grow their seedlings with two cups of that char grow mix, right, to five gallons of potting soil. And their seedlings are in 128s because they, they're farmers. They're not putting big plants out. And that means they're using hardly any per plant. But what it does is inoculate the life on those roots, and the life keeps going out. And that's why they get that effect. The other key thing to know, though, and John Nilsson, the, one of the co-owners of Chargro, makes this point over and over again, it's critical, is part of why Ron is at that impact is he does his cover crops perfectly. He aces his cover crops. And he actually does till them in. He teaches low till. But what he does is he grows the legumes, right? Does everybody know about growing cover crops? How many people here grow cover crops? Okay. So if you're going to grow cover crops, right, what you want to do is grow a legume. Legumes are things like peas, clover, um, vetch, right? These are things that are able to take nitrogen from the air. The air is like somebody better at um, science than me. I think it's like in the 90s percent nitrogen. If it was all oxygen, we'd be on fire all the time. It's mostly nitrogen, but plants can't use it, right? But this, these legumes have a symbiotic relationship with roots, right? And the roots make little houses for them, the little nodules, and then the right bacteria gets in there. Usually you have to inoculate until your soil has enough of it, and they make as much nitrogen as the plant needs. So you grow a legume, and then you grow something like rye, a cereal, or buckwheat, and what happens is the rye and the buckwheat need a lot of nitrogen, so they make the legume work harder. So you actually end up getting even more nitrogen from the air because you put the two together. If you just grow the legume, you won't get as much. You know, and you won't be getting that soil building fiber too. So it's the combination you want to grow. Always a legume and a cereal together, right? Um, and we have extensive uh, videos about how to do that at which times of year, so I'm not going to try to go into it in detail now. But what Ron does that we're, we've played with is he doesn't want to work with soil very much. So simply where he's going to put his rows of plants is where he plants his legumes. Because the legumes tend to be a lot more tender and easier to till in, easier to break down. The grains have those big, tough kind of stems like straw, and they don't go away very quick, you know? And they're harder to use the no-till equipment on. So he'll grow things like cow peas in the summertime, or um, Austrian winter peas, or clover, or soybeans, those kinds of things, right? Right where he's gonna put the vegetables. And then, somehow or another, he very coarsely incorporates them, right? But he doesn't incorporate the, um, the cereal, which is on the edges and in between, right? So he's got this grow area and then the grains. And the grains are gonna stay there and help to suppress a lot of the weeds. But right in the band, narrow band where he's planting, the legumes are. And so you can do that too. So you're doing a little bit of tillage, but just where you're planting. And it's not a lot of work because these aren't hard things to work in. They're real succulent, they break down real quick and you can do it that way. So that, those are the kind of things he does, and by doing that, by acing those cover crops, when that char grow goes in, the life that's in there doesn't just have to rely on the foods that are in that inoculant that you're buying that cost so much. They have all of those readily available nutrients from those legumes that were turned under. And that's why it's been so effective. Ron and John, and I agree with them, are certain that you will not have anywhere near the same impact if you try and do that without doing that careful cover cropping. So those kinds of things, that kind of feeding, and this actually, you asked about the amendments. What amendments do you use? Can you tell me? Uh, fertilizer, organic, organic fertilizers, compost, I uh, use mushroom. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what organic fertilizers do you use? Uh, brand, I can't tell you. Any. Okay, is it like Harmony or something like that? I don't know Okay, because a lot of them, right, are um, pasteurized chicken manure, and they're great stuff. It's not very good for the chickens. It's coming from those kind of places that don't treat their animals well, but it's really good fertilizer, you know? 
it works great, but it's really strong and it's very easy to overdo it and actually impact the life in the soil negatively. If you're using the cover crops, it's more like eating a really healthy, high vegetable diet or eating good food, but like lots of steak, you know, yeah. lots of um, cheese, lots of milk, you know, stuff that's not great for our health, you know. Um, a little bit's great, but overdoing it is not as good, you know. And so that's kind of what's going on with the, if you can more rely on the legumes and still use that stuff, but use way less with some carrier of life. And if you go to our biochar workshop and watch six hours, no, you can skip to the very end. <laughs> if you don't want to make biochar, if you're going to buy it, skip the whole thing and just go to where I talk about how to use it, right? Our, we have also soil fertility systems number one. We talk about it there too. You can see ways to use small amounts of life, right? Compost tea, charcoal, inoculated charcoal. The charcoal has actually had compost, been with compost and been with compost tea. Pure charcoal won't do much at first. Eventually it's very it works very well, but it has to have the life in it. But if you use these things that have life, another one that I have on here is mentioned is EM, effective microorganisms. Um, any of these, right, have a diversity of life and they use with just a little bit of fertilizer have a much bigger impact and that healthy kind of impact, you know? Kind of like the inoculate, um, the analogy I'd use is eating yogurt to make sure your stomach's healthy. They're the life that makes sure the digestive system of the soil is working well. So you get all the stuff working well. And they, we've actually seen now, there's been a test, pretty famous test. It's probably on several videos by now. I turned to the camera on purpose for that one because I tell the story over and over again because it applies so many places. And this is a guy named Harry Hointink who is probably retired by now, but he was at Ohio State University. And he took an avocado tree, right? And he infected half of the roots, right, with this nasty, nasty disease called Protophthora cinnamome, which is a root rot, right, from the same family of diseases that causes late blight, causes downy mildew, causes Protophthora capsici. All of these are really terrible diseases that are really hard to fight. And likewise, Protophthora cinnamome, USDA says top 10 worst invasive diseases in the country. You get it, and it pretty much is guaranteed death for whatever perennial, woody perennial you have. It almost certainly will kill it. There's a little trick about using um, wood chips that the um, Christmas tree growers have learned to keep their plants alive, but they can't get rid of the disease. There isn't even a conventional way to kill it without killing the soil. You can use methyl bromide, but if you don't use methyl bromide, you can't really do it. But this disease, if it gets on their roots, it doesn't matter if you keep their feet dry, it's gonna kill them. It does better with the wet, and it comes in with the wet, but if it's there, it's going to kill him. But he took, you guys staying dry enough? Okay. He took compost, very good compost that he made especially to be disease suppressive. And he filled the other half, like he put the roots in one container and another container, right? He infected one side. So the tree started dying immediately. But the other side had that special, really good disease suppressive compost. After a while, the disease went away and they couldn't find it. And that's called acquired systemic immune response. And I think all of us have probably heard about people who had cancer and then all of a sudden it went away. That's probably acquired systemic immune response in people. And we don't know what kicks it in. I mean, I don't know that he, I think he was trying to make a product he could sell, but he wasn't able to reproduce it regularly. But he could make it happen and we make it happen sometimes too. And that's something you're trying to accomplish. We just had a whole workshop by an orchardist, Michael, an orchardist, Michael Phillips, who wrote the Holistic Orchard. And he talked about how to kick acquired systemic immune response into fruit trees. And he has a whole bunch of tricks for that. So that's basically the kind of stuff that, I, that we're trying to accomplish here with our compost tea and our other foods. Come on over here and get out of the rain. Um, I'll, I'll move this way and talk to you all so we can see each other. Um, that's the kind of stuff we're going to try and accomplish by doing things like giving compost tea, growing cover crops, using the right fertilizers. And there's even other things. We just got something, I think it's Gen 1. I forget the name of it, but it's over in the greenhouse. I'm gonna be on a conference call about it tomorrow. But it's a new array of diverse microbial life that was made through some, you know, 14 different microbes that was done by this real talented gardener who just brewed all these things up and made this, you know, reliable mix. 
and they have a bunch of venture capital behind them and they think they're going to take the world over. And if they do, great. If it works, they'll take the world over. They'll be the number one organic amendment and I'll be happy to promote them. Is that yeah. Microzole? Because uh, BB Barnes sells Microzole. It, okay, mycorrhizal, yeah, that's it, that's mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae, mycorrhizae are huge and you want them. And so that's a good one to talk about too. Um, you can buy mycorrhizal inoculants. And if you follow our webpage, you can see two ways to then eventually get them so that they are naturally inoculating compost piles. But I'm not gonna go into the detail there, but if you go to Soil Fertility Systems 1, you'll see about midway through it, or maybe even more towards the end, where we discuss how we did that, you know? Um, and so that's how, yeah, right now I'd buy the mycorrhizae. And why it's so important to have those mycorrhizae is they are the fertility system, the only working fertility system in the winter. The bacteria go to sleep, the mycorrhizae are still building fertility. They also, they have a, like the, like the bacteria I talked about, they have a relationship with the roots. Some of them are endomycorrhizae. Those are mostly the ones that we use for vegetables. They actually grow into the roots, right? And then the roots give them carbohydrates right and other sugars and stuff right and they make minerals like phosphorus which are hard to get available available they actually exude acids and dissolve that phosphorus and make it available so they are giving the, the the calcium and the phosphorus and things to the plants that they need right and trade for these carbohydrates they also know they have a good meal ticket and they take care of their own and now that plant is their own so beneficial microbes will sense a pathogen growing towards like from one plant to another, towards another plant, and they'll grow out to it, meet it, grow around it, and eat it, or dissolve it. Just take it away, you know? And we have a video that shows that. Someday we're gonna have a video, a video night, and we'll show all kinds of videos for growers, you know? <laughs> Don't bring anybody that doesn't watch, wanna watch growing videos, you know? <laughs> we have another room with something else, but you know, just growers' videos. And so that's the reason why you wanna have those mycorrhizae on there, and that's huge huge in giving you control of diseases. And an example, we have Protoptera capsici. Another one of these, they're all water molds and they're the most virulent, dynamic diseases we have, right? And that one comes in with floodwaters and we finally got it. And if you look out there in that terrible rain, there's a row of beans and they're looking pretty darn healthy, right? That's after we got the deer off them. You know, they were looking pretty sparse with the deer. But they came back and that row three years ago had Anaheim peppers on it and the Protopter capsici is called capsici because it attacked when they first had it attacking peppers and when I first learned about it it only attacked peppers pepper family which is tomatoes eggplant peppers and a few rare things right and cucurbits squash cucumbers um, things like that right it didn't attack anything else since then before, and I didn't find this out until after I plant, we plant those beans this year, it's moved on to attacking some weeds and beans. I didn't know that. We had it there, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the nature of how we had it, because our soil health is an example of why we didn't have it as bad and people didn't think we had that, because usually this disease can take out two acres of peppers in a couple of days. It's that virulent. It just like rages through things. Do not take anybody's soil onto your farm. Do not track through anybody else's farm. If you get floodwaters, stay away from there. Don't have any of those host plants there for a while. Let that, th that disease starve out, you know? It's a really bad disease. When we got it, the peppers took the whole summer to die and the whole, the whole row never died. So Sue Colucci used to be our extension agent. She was really great. We got another great one now. We're really lucky to have these great extension agents. She came out. She's a pathologist by training. She said, Pat, I don't think it could be Phytophthora because it's the wrong MO. They'd be dead way faster. You know, they couldn't be dying this slowly, you know? She then looked at it and said, but it looks like Phytophthora. She took it in, sure enough, it was Phytophthora. When she talked to me about it on the phone, she must have said five times, if she said 20 times, you must have incredibly amazing soil. I can't believe that those things didn't die quicker. And she kept saying that over and over again. And that's because of the stuff I'm talking about. So we had the disease, we couldn't stop it, but it didn't rage oh. through, you know? And then I planted beans, which are susceptible, two years later. Now we mounded a bunch of stuff up, but still, with all the rain we've had, it hasn't hit them. So, you know, that diversity gave us the health. 
happy now. I can't overplay this though, because even with all that, we still, you can see when we get to go out there and look at those tomatoes, we got hammered by late blight. We are in late blight central here. You know, notice the lay of the land. We have virtually no drainage, you know. Teeny bit this way, but nothing much, right? Yeah. What does late blight look like? Late blight lo looks like when the tomatoes turn, when the, when the leaves turn black. And then if you look a little later, there's white stuff on the back of the leaf. Now, you mentioned that before. I didn't see any white, but all, I mean, I had tons of fruit. And uh -huh. I had heirloom, uh -huh. heirlooms yeah. that were huge. Yeah, they get it worse. Every single one of them has a brown spot on the flesh somewhere. Yeah, that's probably late blight. Yeah. yeah, and it turns the leaves black. and you got to look close. You know, they don't sporulate for long, and then it kind of dies. And the next one happens. It's kind of at the leading edge of the infection where you see that little white fuzz. And you've got to look close for it. But the black, if it turns black and it happens real fast, that's late blight. And the fruit has that. It gets it too. It gets in the vascular system, you know. Um, really, once you see it, if you start seeing spots on the stem, the only thing I know that will help, that may save it, and it's not reliable, but it does sometimes, is serenade. Because serenade actually goes into the vascular system. Okay. You know? um, and I wrote a whole article about that in 2003. It's a, if you look up the Express, it's called Late Blight Report from the Trenches. And it talks specifically about that effect. You know, we had 10 days of rain. I didn't even want to look at my tomatoes. I was just heartbroken. I went back out. The plants were all alive. They'd had this infection in the vascular system. I was sure they were dead. It rained nonstop for 10 days. I mean, literally almost all day long, every day. But the plants were alive. Wade uh, McCurry at Troy's Greenhouse, who I gave a little bit to, um, called me up and said, what was that stuff? He then was breaking it down until they told him he couldn't because so, he wanted to sell it to all of his customers. He then got on the phone and got the company to make a consumer size because he thought it was so great. Yes. Do you, don't you have to put that on before you get the late flight? That's all the better, but it, uh, it also helped. We, were, we had been putting it on. You know? oh. Why I gave up was because I couldn't spray without it being washed off. Yeah. You know, If it's raining all the time, you know, I remember for several days I'd go out and I'd spray because it, it had been raining a lot before that even, right? I'd spray, and when I finished, it started raining. I was so frustrated. I'd come back, and I'd spray again, and maybe it'd work, but maybe it'd start raining again. Then that one time, I sprayed, and it started raining halfway through the spray, and I went in the house. It didn't stop for 10 days. I couldn't spray, you know? I just figured they had to be dead. The truth is, I never got any more big tomatoes. It was too late in the season, but my sun golds were the only tomatoes at market. And the plants were pathetic. If you ever had a sun gold, you know, they're really incredibly intense, rich flavor. Yeah. These weren't that good. And I was apologizing to my customers. They said, Pat, they're the only tomatoes in the market. Shut up. You know, <laughs> you know, it was that bad, you know. So serenade only is about the, but before that, right, prophylactically, we're going to talk about a whole spray regime. We'll probably look at the stuff first and let you look at the labels and write it down. Take a little break. Um, for you to write, write down those things and all that, and then we'll come back and talk about the spray routine. Then I'm gonna hope that it stops raining enough that we can go over to the compost tea area and show you how we make compost tea. Um, this is the only size you can get serenade? No, no, you can get serenade consumer sizes. That's, oh, okay. And you can thank Wade at Troy's Greenhouse in Burnsville for that. Because okay. when, when things are slow like they are after the busy spring season, he got on the phone and wouldn't stop talking until he did it. And I still will bet you that if you ask that company where the highest concentration of customers for Serenade in the nation is, I bet you it's Burnsville per capita. I bet you it's Burnsville, North Carolina. Because he just, everybody asked Wade what to do and he just couldn't believe what it did. Now he always recommends spraying it with copper sulfate. I don't recommend that because you can overuse copper sulfate. It's more effective, but copper builds up on the soil. So what I recommend is save the copper sulfate for when the infection's on you. The first sign of the infection, then do serenade and copper sulfate, you know, um, and maybe oxidate. The thing about oxidate, I just learned this in my last workshop that I took with Michael Phillips about holistic um, apple orchards. They did research at Penn State. If you spray oxidate and then nothing else, you get more disease. Because what oxidate does, it's like, it's very similar to hydrogen peroxide. It cleans the leaf. It takes everything off it. If you don't put anything else back on, then the late flight goes, well, thank you. There's nobody else in this parking lot. I'll just park everybody here, you know? You're better off to have a bunch of life. And a bunch of our things we use are things like compost tea, 
Serenade and Regalia all and Sonata all are about putting healthy life on the leaf. And some of that life actually likes to eat fungus. You know, so that's that's the approach that we do, you know. Um, so if you use oxidate, which comes in a big container, so it's hard to get for small, small growers, but if you use it, you would use it right before a rain like this, clean it off like in the morning, and then put like compost tea, serenade, EM, those kinds of things, sonata on there so there was good life. You know, so when the tea when the spores land from the late blight, they've got a lot of competition. You know, that's a lot of our strategy is to make that leaf so alive. If you look at a microscopic picture of a leaf, leaf surface, it looks like a jungle. And that jungle is all kinds of yeast and beneficial organisms. You know? So that's the you know that's the concept we're doing. So let's take a break. Yeah. Let's do questions first and then we'll take the break. Yeah. One real quick question. I do hydroponic tomatoes for yes. fun. Uh-huh. Uh, deep water culture and I I really wanted a way to protect them from lake life. And so I got a hold of a company they're called BioWorks. Yes. And they told me about a product called Cease and Mill Stock. I just heard about that from and somebody they else. Said that it was you safe to use in my hydroponic greenhouse tomatoes. Uh-huh. And I just like growing them that way because it's twice as fast and I get twice the production. So right. I'd love to have a few of them. Yeah, sure. So did the cease work to keep the late bio? Uh, I'm using it. I and just bought it. And okay. I just talked to this company. But I'll tell you, I had a white flag problem that I was just struggling with and couldn't get rid of. So I bought a product called Molt X. Uh -huh. And what that does is that slows down the life cycle of those white flies so they can't breed anymore. And it completely yeah. stops them in their track. They're still alive, but it slows them. It like probably them. has azadractin in it or and, neem. And I yeah. also mix yeah. botanic garden. Uh -huh. And what that does is that has a fungus inside of it of sorts. Uh -huh. It basically grows inside that little bug and kills it in two days. Right, but yeah. It's all natural. Yeah, Bavaria, so Bavaria fungus, I was real yeah. Happy. Yes, yeah. that's what yeah. it is. Yeah. I was real happy to find something that I could work with my hydroponic tomatoes. That's a delicate system. Yeah. You, know? you don't yep. want to defeat. I yeah. don't know if this uh, Serenade, Sonata, and Regalia would be appropriate. I don't, think that, I don't think they'll be bad. I think they'll be fine for them. You think it would yeah. be? I don't think, I don't think, it, don't think it'll be any problem at all. Because yeah. those sprays are super expensive. Yeah, they are. I well, spent like 350 bucks on that yeah, stuff. And yeah. I thought, man, I hope this lasts for two years. Yeah, <laughs> they're pretty expensive. And these, these ones are expensive too, but cheaper at CPS. Yeah, you know? I go uh, there all the time. Yeah. Um, Soil health, we got to give you a rough idea of that. Go check out the videos, right? Genetics is huge. We actually grew no heirloom tomatoes here except for one that I grew by mistake. What okay. Well, it was supposed to be a cross with Cherokee Purple and Defiant that I made that I had good results. The people had told me it had done well that we'd never grown here. Somehow or another, my last pack, the label got changed. I ended up putting Oxheart out there. Oxheart has no disease resistance whatsoever. And it was the typhoid Mary of our tomato patch, you know? So we, it came in, we had a really bad blight, and it was, that, it was all the worst right there. Everybody said, well, you can sure tell these resistant ones are better because the ox heart was totaled and the other ones were all damaged but not bad, you know. But um, we didn't grow heirlooms. We said we were going to grow them in another field under cover. We never got it done. Our heirlooms all stayed in the pots and didn't get in the ground. But we grew, and we'll show you what our success rate was. Um, Defiant, very, very resistant, really does well. Highly recommend it. And next, Mountain Magic, really darn good. You know, not a big tomato, about this big, but really, you, you'll see out there, boy, there's blight on everything, and that, those are just looking good, you know. We still got hammered, but they're still producing like crazy. Then for plum tomatoes, Plum Regal. It's also got a lot of blight, but we're harvesting, we're making sauce, you know. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean we don't have to spray, but we're keeping them alive between spraying and that. And we have, you know, because of this bowl effect, we get the blight really bad, you know. So those are the ones that did best. Other ones we tried, didn't do as well. Mountain Fresh Plus usually does better. Hmm. Probably might have the Typhoid Mary Ox Hearts in there is why, yeah. you know. But also Smarty usually does pretty well. Didn't do that well this year. That's not specifically noted to be blight resistant, but it's worked for us pretty well. Other ones we tried, Mountain Merit. I think it's likely out there. I, we'll look at it, actually, if I, can, if I can find a moment to call Meredith. She might be able to tell me, but I'm pretty sure... Mountain Merit's doing pretty well too, and it's a, it is a blight resistant one. All of these blight resistant ones are from the genetic program at NC State. Mm -hmm. 
done right up here at Fletcher Research Station. They're major tomato re innovators right up the road. Like and it's got a thing going on in two days, right? Yeah, but that's for cucurbits, right? No, is it the tomato workshop? Tomato okay, yeah. Field yeah. Day. yeah. Tomatoes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, they're, they are the stars for blight-resistant tomatoes. They do the very, Randy Gardner was the first, first now he's got a successor whose name I don't know, but um, incredible, incredibly resistant compared to other ones, you know? So genetics is huge, you know? If, you, if you're gonna grow heirlooms, grow them someplace away from the, the resistant ones. So if you lose the heirlooms, you still have, you know, which is what we always do, yeah. <coughs> the local farmers all plant their tomatoes in raised beds with plastic, black plastic. So I went to Crop Production Services and got one of those rolls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to use, like, sometimes they use bromide gas to kill all yeah. the weeds before they lay that plastic and some other nasty chemicals, which mm -hmm. I'm not going to do. Right. But why not? Why shouldn't I take that black plastic? I was going to do an experiment next year, no. lay it down, no reason not and to. then just see yeah. if the weeds will come up through it. I was told by one of the old farmers, he said, well, maybe the weeds will come up through it. but. It seems to work really good. No, I know plenty of farmers that don't use methyl bromide and use plastic and it keeps the weeds down. The scientist guy that I was Pardon? telling you about. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. scientist guy that I was yeah. telling you about that's growing tomatoes in the field next to my garden because yeah. I have a big field. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, he used all mountain merit. I asked him. Uh -huh. And those plants are beautiful. Mountain merit really those rocks. Those things, yeah. man, they're huge. They're yeah. bushy. They're just fantastic. Yeah. They don't grow too tall. Yeah. Yeah. Although he's working out there every day on them, them yeah. things. With and the he mass. works a real job. Uh -huh. Yeah, they With have, the man, they have the full thing. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. know, those guys, it seemed like they'd be getting cancer when they get old from all this. Um, yeah, I'm not going to make a comment, but I, I got a reason why I don't do it. That's for yeah. sure. You know? I mean, don't you think it'd be yeah. pretty devastating yeah. your health? I mean, yeah. over time. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm glad he's wearing full protection. Yes. I read that we should prune our tomato plants from the soil all the way this high is well that I don't help? know that it has to be that high but well, get them, get okay so that all right that's going to cause me to jump ahead but I'll do it when I'm at the bottom of the thing I talk about know the diseases MO right. the reason to do that right a little bit of pruning is good to get some air in there right. and I'm going to talk about that in environment but the the ground pruning is so you don't get splash up right. and that's about alternaria or early blight late blight as I already said isn't here if you don't have somebody growing volunteer potatoes until it blows in. Problem is there's always somebody growing volunteer potatoes, so it is around, you know. But you won't have it on your land, and it doesn't come from the soil. It comes through the air, right? It's airborne. There's two different types of spores. One of them can travel anywhere from 10 to 30 miles in a night. You know, they call them swimming spores. They move through wet, so wet air, you know. And they're really infective that way. Alton area is in the soil. If you, have, if you use stakes and don't sterilize them, it'll be on the stakes. We had a terrible infection because my grower didn't know and how bad it was. And he, he, he started his tomatoes way too early. And then they got stressed and they got an alternaria. They get late, early blight then, right? And he let them be in there. He had this massive infection of, late, of early blight. And then he didn't sterilize the greenhouse. The next year, as soon as the tomatoes came up, they started getting early blight. Huh. And I came down as a full-time employee. And the first thing we did in the winter was take that greenhouse apart. And uh -huh. we had Storax, which is a different version of Oxidate. But it's basically like hydrogen peroxide. We just sterilize the entire greenhouse. I never sterilize pots because we don't need to. We use compost. We don't get those kind of diseases. Mm -hmm. We sterilized all our pots. We sterilized everything. Our, our, our early blight problems are largely gone because we know that it, it, is, it is on stuff and we make sure it's clean and we mulch so we don't get the soil splash wow. up. <laughs> so if you don't get the, so the soil splash up, yeah. If you have the mulch down and your branches, they're literally laying on the ground, is that okay because you're, it's mulched? If you're not seeing sign of early blight, it's okay. If you're seeing sign of early blight, I'd take them off, you know? Yeah, because, you know, there might be some stuff that's making its way up through the rain. How those branches? Should you cut them, like, right by the stalk or yeah. further out where it gets thinner? No, you really want to take them off at the, right at the stem, and you want a really good, clean snap. Mm -hmm. If you can't get a clean snap, a good, clean cut because you can cause secondary rots if you do those wounds further out. Mm -hmm. It's just like trees. Trees like to be cut right at the tree. Otherwise, you're leaving material that the plant, plant knows how to protect from when a leaf falls off, you know. It doesn't know how to protect a damaged branch on a tree or a damaged leaf. So you want to do them right close to the thing and you want a really nice, clean cut, you know. But if you're cutting, you got to sterilize your cut. After every plant, you know. I mean, if, if it, because you, you you're not going to pass late blight that way, but you will pass other diseases that way, you know. 
I mean, late blight, I, you could pass it that way, but it's in the air, so it's not, that's not, you know. But there are just mostly viral diseases, which we don't get a lot of here. Um, but yeah, you want to avoid that. They get transmitted by things that pierce them and then go pierce something else. So your knife is doing the same thing, you know. Yeah. I saw a really good video by NC Tomato Man. Uh -huh. I really like the way he stakes his tomatoes. He puts down one stake and then he makes two liters yeah. grow and then he'll tie them to that one stake. And that to me looked like the air was able to get in. And it seemed like, you know, it's a quick and dirty method. Mm -hmm. Just to, mm -hmm. it, he had like 200 potted tomato plants and I might have 100. Mm -hmm. So we do a way that works really well commercially, but it's uh, not the best for blight resistance mm -hmm. because every time we tie them up, we pull them together again. Uh -huh. And that's called the Florida weave. Uh -huh. And that's what they use in the field. So we do that commercial tie, uh -huh. but it is not the best. And I'm thinking of do some trials. Uh -huh. There's, I could tell you ways to tie tomatoes for the next three days. You know, <laughs> well, that's good. I'd love to listen to one of my favorite <laughs> ways actually for like a home grower uh -huh. is to get concrete reinforcing wire uh -huh. and make nice big towers. And you have to put some rebar on the ground to hold them or they'll just tip over. Yeah. But you just do them every four plants. Mm -hmm. Then you take bamboo and stick it in between. You know, so you make this like lattice work. Across you know. the top. Yeah. yeah, across, you know, not so just across the top, the but all the way up. Yeah, so you only have to, you know, do every four tomatoes with the concrete reinforcing wire so it doesn't take that much. And then the bamboo runs across it. Runs in between them, huh. you, know, two, you know, on both sides, you know. And they're totally caged. There's no pruning needed and they're quite airy. Mm -hmm. It works pretty darn well. Works real good. Did you stop seeing mine? You doing it that way? That's the way I do mine. Stop <laughs> up and walk step up. There. Okay, I will. I'll stop up and see. Are you right up the hill from Tim? I'm, yeah, I'm in the brown brick house right okay. there. Okay, I'll check them yeah, out, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. the way. And I done my beans like that, my uh -huh. greasies. Yeah. I've got them eight foot high. Uh -huh. I uh -huh. just tried it. Uh-huh, yeah, but see, it's yeah, a natural, it's right. That's, I use right. concrete like yeah. this. Right, it's yeah. five foot long, yeah. and it rolls around. Yeah, perfect. yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and they're coming out of that five. Just foot. watch yourself when you're cutting them because it'll jab you. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it'll jab you, you know. Yeah. But is the concrete already like eight feet tall? Five feet. Five feet, yeah. And, yeah. and I, put, I put three more feet on top. Uh, and bamboo? No. Uh, I just cut another another roll. Oh. Uh -huh. And then I cut it three and foot long. Some. He's just showing off. off. <laughs> so yeah there are tons of way. another way is to just run a real strong strand over the top mm -hmm. really yeah. strong and then just drop a string yeah. and you know That's and we do that method. we do that in the greenhouse yeah. you know it works really well we actually get these spools that you can lower the tomatoes and then you lower them yeah. take the leaves off and bury the stem and it renews the tomato you know we do that with cucumbers you can get plants to produce from spring to frost. Now don't you have to uh, prop up your, like if you got a, a piece of metal going across, like in my greenhouse, mm -hmm. I got a piece of metal mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, going across, I got them on either side. Mm -hmm. uh, shouldn't I take a four by four if I was to get really heavy? Yeah, down? sure. Yeah, so you, common sense. Yeah. You see it looks like it's going to go, give it some support. Yeah, 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 yeah. totally. Yeah. Okay, so um, genetics resistance, huge. You know, of the heirlooms, Cherokee purple is one of the best, oh, you know. Good. I've also found that um, the ones that have a lot of different names, like, you know, the, the Mr. Stripey type are better than some, you know. Brandywine, we don't even grow anymore. Brandywine is like, it's, the reason it tastes so good is it puts no energy into defense whatsoever. It gets sick so fast, I can't believe it, you know. So we've stopped. We actually grow Prudence purple, which is similar. I will agree, not as wonderful as Brandywine, but it actually lives long enough for us to get fruit. What yeah. about a controlled environment? Just controlled so environment, yeah, them. totally, totally. That's what, when I talk about environment, uh -huh. a huge thing is for most of these diseases, if you can simply cover your tomatoes, you're 99% of the way there, huh. you know? Keeping the rain off them is huge. Wow. And it's not that hard. It's not that hard at all. I mean, we don't get snow load in the summer. You don't need to build a big, strong structure. And drip yeah. irrigate or something like that? Yeah, we drip, we drip, we drip irrigate, yeah. Um, you simply, and we have, we don't need, we have ever done that though. We've made, we're going to make a big one in the four acre field where we use your flail mower. We're going to do that next year so we can put a lot of heirlooms out, you know. And so what I, what, what I do is I go to the big plumbing houses, places that put a lot of wells in and they'll usually save their PVC pipe mm -hmm. and sell it cheap. So I buy it cheap from them you know, and then get rebar and drive rebar on the ground, stick one end in, mm -hmm. stick rebar, you know, it's probably, a, you can probably make a 15, 20 foot greenhouse with this 40 foot piece of, oh, I mean, yeah. no, it's actually a 20 foot piece, so it's probably going to be a 
10 foot greenhouse or something like that. Mm -hmm. Though you can join them together and make it bigger, right? There's no snow load, right? Yeah. And I just put rebar on the other side, put it over, and then you need some stabilizing side pieces. I would just get like scrap cheap pieces from, you know, throw away stuff at the lumber yard, take my screw gun, drill it in. It wasn't pretty, but it worked. Mm -hmm. I put a, a pearl in on top to make it nice and rigid. You don't need to. I've seen people that don't do that because it's hard to get up there and do that part, you know. And then the thing that's critical is do not buy construction grade plastic to cover it. Because yeah. what will happen is two thirds of the way through the summer, sometime when you cannot do anything about it and it's going to rain, it'll just fall apart in a big wind. Yeah. It doesn't take the sun, you know, especially when it's stretched like that, it'll fall apart really fast. So go ahead and break down and buy the UV treated plastic and you can get that readily. Let's see, it probably, I don't know if CPS, do you know if CPS carries that? I don't know. Greenhousemegastore.com. Yeah, yeah. right. This season. Van, Van Wingerden does, pardon? This season. Fifth Season carries it, Van, Van Wingerden. Van doesn't sell to the general public, though. That, they actually sell plastic greenhouse supplies. They do. You can, see, you can buy greenhouse That's supplies from them, yeah. How about yeah. Jade? Pardon? Jade Systems. Jade Systems, I don't know if they sell, if they sell like to the public, too. See, what they won't so do, they none of those people public. will do, though. Pardon? They'll sell to the public if they have okay, it. Okay, well, they, they have it for sure. Um, what they won't do is take some off a roll. I know two places. Otherwise, you got to buy 100 feet, which for a small garden, it's going to cost you a couple hundred bucks. You better find somebody to share it with. Yeah. The other trick, though, is you can go to Farm Tech, yeah. T-E-K, right. and they sell it by the foot. Great. And if you ever get up to Troy's Greenhouse or if you get the deal set up and you reach me, I can pick it up for you because I go buy him whenever I come down here. He sells it by the foot, too. <laughs> you know? And he's actually cheaper because he doesn't charge you shipping because he gets it on a truck. So he has a better price. So who is this again, please? Troy's Greenhouse. The number, phone number is 828-682-6439. Oh, that's a good Yeah. That's six mil? Six mil, UV treated. Well, that's that's what you want. Classic. So he sells it. He sells it. He'll sell it by the foot. And you know, that's a long way to drive, but if you connect with him and me, I can pick it up for you. When you cover your tomatoes with the plastic and you put your irrigation down, you use one line or two underneath that plastic? You know, I think we use two here, but I've used one and it worked fine. Now, when it rains, you don't need to water then. You just yeah. only water when it's really Yeah, hot. tomatoes really don't need tons of water. Don't the roots for the, the flavor's don't better if you don't water too much with tomatoes. The best yeah. tasting tomatoes are dry land grown. Mm -hmm. A trick that they do is they, they just put a really deep hole and plant a tall tomato in there. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like struggling for the sun at first. It's below the ground. By the time it gets real dry, you know, they get the spring rains. By the time it gets real dry, those roots are down like 18, 20 inches. Yeah. And they're pulling minerals up. And they're just working real hard. And that thing is just loaded with minerals and flavor because it worked real hard. So that plastic... What I was told by a farmer is that those roots go out 18 to 24 inches oh, yeah. toward the yeah. top of the ground. And that, so I was wondering, if you have that plastic, then you don't really need to water if it rains because the tomato roots... Oh, yeah. No, I mean, get they'll get water. for. If, I don't think you would, unless we were in a major drought. I don't think it would be a problem. Which I don't think you get yeah. that too much here. Yeah. Well, it does happen. I've been through them, you know. Yeah. You get great tomatoes if you have irrigation. Uh -huh. A drought is a great year for a farmer if they've got irrigation. It's yeah. a disaster if they don't have irrigation. You know? Anyway, other kinds of environmental things. The number one thing is that cover, right? Oh, do not have the wall plastic come all the way down the walls. You'll cook your poor tomatoes. Yeah. Have the wall, have it pretty high up, you know. If you're doing it so that it's facing south, then you probably want to have the backside a little lower because it's going to be cooler. It'll create some convection, you know. But if it's running east-west, which is actually better, you know, if it's not running east west, if it's running north south, so it's not facing south, right? Mm -hmm. But facing, getting the sun first thing in the morning, a lot of it, and getting it later in the afternoon, so it gives you get you don't have so much heat build up in the middle of the day. South facing ones get really hot at the at the peak of the day because they're getting so much sun. Running it the other way, so it, it faces east and west, is much much more effective at not overheating your greenhouse. I've had to put on a shade cloth on mine because uh -huh. yeah. it was just it gets too hot. Just yeah. way too hot. So I use forty percent. Uh -huh. I figured that was a happy medium. What's your viewpoint? On I'd go for less actually for production and flavor. I would That's use less. So expensive. I'm not going to pay. Yeah. Well, the other thing you can do though is use surround. You know uh -huh. what surround is? Surround is used by organic growers to keep bugs off of things. Uh -huh. It's just kaol kaolinite clay. Oh yeah. It's super that. fine. Yeah. You spray that on there and it cools the plant off and since plants when they get hot photosynthesize less mm -hmm. 
it actually causes more photosynthesis. Even though there's some blockage mm -hmm. of light because of the surround, the fact that it's cooler longer in the day, they actually make more sugars and produce more food. Mm -hmm. So I'd use that. I wouldn't use 40%, so you're giving up too much light. Right. You're going to so reduce you your production. 30. Pardon? So you think 30 is ideal for growing veggies? I grow yeah. lettuces, tomatoes, and peppers. Yeah, I'd, I would definitely be more trusting of 30. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll have to switch. But try this around, too. I mean, maybe don't buy more. I bet the surround will do the trick for you. You won't have to buy it. And then you get full sun mm -hmm. and more photosynthesis, you know. Yeah. So anyways, that's the, the number one thing about environment. But the other things about environment mm -hmm. is if you can plant where there's air drainage, huge difference. That year that I talked about where it rained all that time, mm -hmm. I also ran the garden for Mountain Air, which is a high-end country club. And their garden was put on the side of a mountain. They put, laid a bunch of big boulders and then backfilled in. So there's like a 10-foot drop-off. And it's on a hill. So there's air coming down. Mm -hmm. It hits that garden and then drops off dramatically. Wow. They, and we had, we had you know, them sprayed like everything else, right? They actually got tomatoes. They not only didn't lose the plants, they had blight for sure, but they actually got big tomatoes that year that all I got was sun golds. Hmm. And it was because of that, that air drainage. Mm -hmm. It's huge. If you can get that turbulence, so pick those places. You got places you can do that. You know, you got slopes. Planting on a slope for tomatoes, it pays. You get that airflow, that's a really good thing. You know, where we are is about as bad as it can be. You know, <laughs> you know it's like we're at the bottom. We got a little bit of airflow, but it ain't much. You know, that's about what I have. Yeah, in my yeah. Place. And so what we do have is rich soil. That's you know, that's the way bottom land is. You know, um, so, so that's. Have you tried um, uh, the New Jersey Rutgers tomato? I love the New Jersey Rutgers tomato, and it's more light resistant than some of the heirlooms, but doesn't compare to these new ones. You know. Oh at all you know it's very disease resistant of the other diseases you know it's a really tasty really good heirloom I like it a lot yeah um, I have tried I haven't grown it recently though I have to tell you when you've been growing as long as I've been growing you're always trying new things you lose track of sometimes some good things you know just because you you're always putting new things in the mix you take it out you forget something else is good but that doesn't mean the, other, the one that came out was bad mm -hmm. you know um, other things there's a I attended a talk one time where the guy said Make sure whatever you're growing has maximum sunlight on it because the best fungicide in the world is, fungus is sunlight. And it's totally true. So trying to, you know, some pruning is good. Trying to tie your plants up so they're not too tight on each other so they have that sunlight coming in. Sunlight and air movement, you know. So the other thing, a trick that you can do if you're commercial growers, it's hard because if you're picking tomatoes, you don't want to pick tomatoes from one plant, walk past two squash plants and go pick, and pick more tomatoes. You're trying to get it done in a hurry. But that's actually a good strategy. If you're growing a bunch of squash, winter squash or something, put a tomato in, then leave a bunch of space, but don't leave it to nothing, grow squash. They're down low to the ground, you got the air movement, they don't have the same diseases, you know? So that kind of interplanting can really give you, you can use the same amount of land and get much more space around your plants, you know? Um, and I've done it and it's helped. You know, the year that we had that wicked weather, and that's how I did it that year. And a fellow farmer was being a partner with, partner with me this, that year, and he didn't pay attention to how to measure. He, he measured, he was a measuring stick, right? But then he was making big holes. And by the time he planted, he planted on this side of the hole or that side of the hole. So he was losing like 12 inches because he was making these one foot holes. And he had lots of his plant, the plants close together. Those plants wiped out before that 10 days of rain even came. The ones that we spaced, like we had a, we had a tomato and then a squash, a tomato and a squash. They got to the rain before they got hit. Mm. But the ones that didn't have that spacing, they were just gone, you know. So spacing counts for a whole lot, you know. So those are the kind of environmental things you can do that make a big difference for tomato disease. Um, and then be part of your community, both your digital community and your neighbor community. Follow the, you know, get on, go to, I should have put Dr. Janine Davis. She's right up here at the research station. If you put a punch in Dr. Janine Davis, North Carolina State University specialty crops, her website will come up. Get on her mailing list because as soon as she hears there's late blights, she sends out an email. So you know it's there and you don't even look. You just go out there and you spray your biggest gun. You know, if it's going to be copper, spray it because it's coming and you want to be sure that you don't get it, you know. So I don't say to use copper ca casually, but if you know it's in your immediate area, then the first rain event, it's going to be there, you know because it can move 10, 15 miles in a good rainy day, you know. 
So you just put the copper out right away. And I put copper and serenade out together, you know. Um, you might, you know, you might wait till after the rain, you know, but be spraying serenade right up to it. And then right after the rain, don't look for the disease. Just put, go out there and put the copper in the, in the serenade. And then back off again till you see it or till you hear a sign of even more, you know. But also talk to your neighbors, you know. And maybe you can get your neighborhood to not grow volunteer potatoes in bad blight years. We have years where it's too warm at night. We don't get late blight. Fine. Next year, grow your volunteer potatoes. No problem. But if we had late blight like last year and this year, try and get people not to grow those volunteer potatoes because I guarantee you they have that disease, you know. And then you're going to get it early, way earlier than you would otherwise, you know. So that's what I mean. Community is really part of the defense. You uh, had a patch pretty close to you. Potatoes yeah, right yeah, here, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if they had volunteers coming back, but I bet they did. Yeah, yeah I bet they did. Yeah, yeah. We always, I mean, you know, we're just near all the diseases everywhere. Yeah. One thing you said was um, keeping the sides of your uh, high tunnel or your greenhouse rolled up, but then that kind of juxtaposed with the idea that you need to keep all the rain out. Oh, no, you, you got to roll it up only enough to keep the rain out. Yeah, yeah. What you might want to do is keep it up on the hot days and drop it when you get in a rainy period, mm -hmm. but still. Try not to drop it all the way so you get some air circulation, you know. The truth is, it, those tomatoes can still get wet because dew, mist, you know. I mean, stuff blows in everywhere where you can't, you know, unless you close it up totally, you know. That's kind of what I was thinking, just to keep everything out. But. Well, you, would, you can do that. In the rainy periods, that's fine, yep. you know. But I wouldn't do it down low. I'd let some, I'd have some, some vent areas like a, a window open up top and a window down low and then not much is going to blow in, you know. If you can, if you're willing to do that much management, that's ideal, you know. Yeah. But then if the sun comes out and you're not home, those guys are going to cook, yeah, you they're know. Gonna, they're gonna yeah. So it's a happy medium. I think more just try and find a place where not much comes in. They stay pretty darn dry. Watch those places that may get rained and be ready to either cull those or spray those to control it. You know, you get a lot more control, a whole lot more control that way. You know. Um, this greenhouse here, we we get tomatoes all the time, even in bad blight years. I mean. And now we're doing this, you know, we can walk over and see it. We're doing them on um, the strings and pruning the heck out of them. And we're not seeing any disease of that. We're seeing other diseases more like, you know, rot, root rot kind of things from being in a greenhouse a long time. But as far as the foliar diseases, no, with all that pruning, all that air circulation. Even with like a big rainstorm right now and the windows, I mean, the, the sides being completely rolled up. Well, we don't plant the tomatoes next to the wall. We, we go in a little bit, you know. Ah, so yeah. you're going to show us yeah. Yeah, sure. We'll walk and see those. Yeah, let me just run through the rest of this and we're almost done. Know your pathogen. I already gave you the example of the Altanaria, right? And the, or the early blight. Like, so if you don't sterilize your stakes, you don't mulch your ground, you know, you don't clean your pots, you're going to get that disease before you need to, you know. It can move through the air, but it's mostly going to be gotten from those other sources. So you can greatly reduce the, pro the infection rate if you just make sure things are good and clean. Late blight doesn't matter at all. You know, it's not going to it's not going to be an issue, but you still want to do the, the, the sterilizing because you can get early blight. You know, mm -hmm. there's a bunch of other diseases, but I don't know that pe that we have much problem with them around here. You know, and I guess before I go into actually talking about the actual sprays, um, I want to talk about the few other kind of because this is billed as the tomato terrors, even though I said we we're doing late blight mostly just to make it interesting. We and we like the term tomato terrors. You know, it sounds good. Um, so. Does everybody know how to not get their tomatoes to split? No. Okay. I don't. It's very simple. Pick every ripe one before any big rain event. <laughs> they split because of too much rain. If it's, been, if, it's been, if it's raining all the time, they tend not to split. Some are much more prone. Sun gold is very prone to splitting. There's one put out by Monsanto, owned by Monsanto. It wasn't originally by Monsanto called Sun Sugar. That's very similar, and it doesn't split. They bred the splitting out of it. Okay. You know. But if you have tomatoes that are prone to splitting, Picking them before a rain event, you won't get the splitting. Oh, you know, it's as simple as that. You know, um, and also a big fertilization event. Same thing. It's all about a big burst of growth, and the skin can't keep up with it and split. You know, so that's it. Blossom end rot. Everybody know how to deal with blossom end rot? No. no. Okay, but everybody knows what blossom end rot is, right? Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah. All right. Blossom end rot is where you get rot always right at the base, right where the flower was. Okay, and it is much as you may think. It's a, it, you know. And I, before I learned it, would be knocking the flowers off so the, the fungus couldn't get in there. But it's a result of not enough calcium. Mm -hmm. um, and so simply, if you have it, 
and your tomatoes are happening right now, best thing to do is a foliar feed of calcium. You know, if you can do a foliar feed within 10 days, you'll stop the blossom end rot. You know, once it gets through the whole system and is getting to the fruit, you don't have it. We had it really bad in our new greenhouse because we had such massive production and we got totally thrown off because we did a tissue sample that said we had way too much calcium in the leaves. Now either that test was wrong or for some reason the calcium first goes to the leaves and then goes to the fruit. I don't really know that part. But we just gave a, 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 a foliar feed of calcium on Saturday, I think, and I guarantee you by beginning of next week or something, we're going to start to see way less blossom in rot. We actually used um, something called um, CalMag from uh, oh, something general. It's, it's one of the things that they sell at um, Fifth Season. But I have basically marble flour. It's pure carbon, um, calcium carbonate. You don't want to breathe it but it, you can put, dilute it in water and spray it. And I want to go to that next if we need to do it again because we don't need any more magnesium, you know. So we're okay with magnesium now. I'm only going to use the calcium. You had a question? Yes, on a sprayer. Um, in my greenhouse, it's small, so I do a pump sprayer. Mm -hmm. But I was told that you have to have a minimum of 60 PSI, and the one I bought I noticed was 40. Now, there's a place down in Asheville. I can't think of it right this second. Um, it's either Northern Tool is one of them, and then there's that other place across from the Taco Bell. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name. But the point I'm trying to make is they sell sprayers that are either 60 PSI, 90 PSI, 120 PSI. What should I use? I, I highly recommend the highest PSI you can get okay. and, a, and a nozzle that can be really tight so you get that Don't fog. Fog? Yeah, the yeah. fog is ideal. And it's, not, it's, it's partly about good coverage, uh -huh. you know. Um, frankly, the sprayer we use because it's convenient is not as good as the one that's the best. Mm -hmm. Our little backpack sprayer, which I hate because it's a, you got a gas motor, gas, and then the liquid. Uh -huh. It's really heavy. Yeah. It's really noisy, you know, it's a, and it's smelly. I hate it, but it does a better job, you know. For the homeowner, I would recommend going to those kind of places and buying one of those $100 okay. ones with at least 60 PSI or higher. But then you have to remember uh -huh. that when you use it and you're using things like Serenade, uh -huh. Double Nickel, um, compost tea, you cannot be up close and spray or you just turned all of that life into smushed protoplasm. You have to stand back and let it float in. You know, okay. It has to be able to decelerate. So it comes out at 120 or something like that, mm -hmm. but then it slows down. I mean, actually the backpack sprayer is like 240. Mm -hmm. you know? So it gets an incredible mist, so but I'll you stand back yeah. and it just, and so as you walk, you're going to be then mm -hmm. having some of the stuff that's coming out to the plants you just sprayed that's going to be just pushed pro protoplasm. Yeah. But the stuff that first got it when it decelerated, it's going to be good. Okay. Now, shouldn't I wear long sleeves and some... What you should wear, yeah, you should totally wear protection. You really, the little, like, just breathe-through mask isn't oh, worth much. You want a respirator. Oh, a respirator. Yeah. Okay, that, thank you. Yeah, that's really ideal, and, you know, that's best practice, and that's what we should do here. My guys don't do it. They're hot, and they, you know, they think they're invincible, yeah. you know. But they're not, you know. They really should do it, yeah. well, you know. Um, do you wear protection when you're spraying? Do you wear protection when you're spraying? I don't actually do the spraying. Oh, we do it like from the tractor. Uh -huh. And I don't believe that a respirator is good. Uh -huh. so, I've never uh, worn one either. But, but I could be wrong. Sure. I'm usually not around because I'm not trying to be yeah, in the right, yeah. that stuff. <laughs> Make sure they're not breathing, the, you know. They, would not, they don't want to breathe any of this stuff, you know. It wasn't designed to be in the human lungs, yeah. you know. Um, that's yeah. definitely, you know, follow those rules. Those rules are good. I mean, they're hot, you know. I mean, and I, I won't say I've never cheated. I have, but I tried not to. I tried to do it right, you know. But if I was out in the field and I needed to get a spray in and I didn't have my respirator with me, yeah. I didn't have my long sleeve shirts, I just tried to hold my breath and go. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but I it wasn't smart, you know. I don't wear anything, but I know yeah. you're to. You should. I, I actually do recommend I that. Yeah. Will. Um, okay, so sprays, you saw them over there. Hopefully you wrote down the names of any you didn't know about, right? Okay. We start the season with compost tea. You know, my ideal is to be doing compost tea a lot early in the season when the plants are tiny, right? And we immediately also start using regalia because it's about raising the level of phenols in the leaves. So we, you know, we may let the plants get to be three weeks in the ground before we use regalia because it's not cheap. But it's not, May is not over, we're using regalia. What yeah. is regalia? Regalia is a, an extract, a, a proprietary extract of giant knotweed. That Japanese knotweed, the weed that's taking over Madison County, 
you know, and it's starting to threaten Yancey County. It's in every ditch, you know. It's that, and actually what it does is it causes the plants to make more phenols in the leaves. And the phenols are a defense system. Mm -hmm. They make it not as hospitable to fungi. So it's, it's pretty effective, you know. It's one of, the, one of the few things that Kelly Iverson, who used to be our pathologist at the research station, thought had any impact in an organic mode on downy mildew, which is, a, you know, in the same family of water molds as, uh, as late blight, you know, a really nasty disease. Regalia? Yeah, regalia, yeah. So we do that just as a matter of course. It's, we do any of the susceptible plants to major nasty diseases like downy mildew or um, late blight or early blight. We just put regalia on them from mid to late May through the season. You know? How often? Um, we spray at least once a week and we try to spray more if it's raining. You know? okay. Our tomatoes don't, don't look as good right now because wires got crossed and someone who was supposed to be spraying went, on a, went to a wedding and thought he told me that he was going, but if he did tell me, it didn't register. We didn't, we didn't make it clear enough, but I'm going to make sure you, everybody understands now. If you say you're going away and you're the spray person, make sure we talk about what's going to happen. Don't just say it and think that I'm going to get it. I don't remember him telling me at all. I missed it totally if he told me. You know, Maybe he thought he told me. I'm not sure. But anyways, it was right at the beginning of the whole infection. And we had like three or four days when we weren't getting a spray routine. And I actually texted them saying, be in touch with me about the spray routine unless you're absolutely confident. And never got a, email, a text back, so I didn't follow up. And then, you know, we got, we got behind. You know, so our plants, anything that was marginal, we lost. You know, they're just not worth having anymore. But we do have, you know, ones on, we'll go out there and look at them in a minute. You know, so we start with compost tea and regalia. And then we, go, we kick in double nickel, which is not making the phenol levels higher, but making the life on the, on the leaves more vibrant, so they're just not as hospitable. And that may also be helping to kick the acquired systemic immune response in, we're hoping. So we then go to that, we do that more once like, pardon? Once a week? We, we do it once a week if we think we're going into a rainy time. Okay. Otherwise we do it more like every other one or so, you know. Okay. We rotate, once we get to where we have flowers on our, on our tomatoes, they're, tomatoes are way more vulnerable once they're in flower. Right, they're putting energy into making seed. Their defense system is not as, you know, up up top there, and it's and it's warmer weather. The diseases are more likely to be coming. So we then go to always spraying either Serenade or Sonata, both of which are antifungals that are actually active against the fungal fun, the fungi. You know, so we rotate those. We hold off on the copper sulfate and the oxidate till the disease is actually here. Mm. If we think we have disease. Then, and we're going to do compost tea. Marsha will come in in the morning if it's, not, if it's a sunny day. Now, if it's a rainy day, he wouldn't do this, right? But if it's a sunny day, he'll come in in the morning or in the early afternoon, he'll spray oxidate. He'll let that effect stay there for, you know, a few hours, even though it should be done in a minute or two, mm -hmm. and then come back in the evening with compost tea and serenade. You know, if we have disease, there's serenade going to be in there with the compost tea or sonata, you know. So then to come back in, we'll spray that. So the idea is we're first wiping the slate clean and then we're putting good life back on that leaf, you know. And so that's our, that's our routine. When we're really like feeling like we're up against the wall, that's when we hit it with the copper sulfate. We've sprayed copper sulfate four times this, this month, this season. And we never like what it does to plants. It's always hard on plants. Mm. At least the Nordux is no longer what we use because it was wicked. I mean, they were really hurt by it. The, the champ is not as bad, you know. So... We do that. Ones we haven't used that I mean to use, um, and I, I have no excuse except for I keep forgetting to get it. I got given a half gallon or you know a, a big container of Sporatec. Mm -hmm. That's basically clove oil and cinnamon oil and thyme oil, things like that. So it's those kind of aromatic oils. Mm -hmm. And they say it's very effective, so I really should be trying that. You know, So we'll put that into the mix too. Um, the other one that we're not using that it makes no sense not to, that I should have been, I just forgot that I wanted to try it, and there's a product called Effective Microorganisms, EM, and that you can actually brew your own. You get, a, you get a, a, a mother bottle, and you can make gallons at a time by using small amounts of it. You just add molasses and let it sit in a warm place, and that's just more life that you're adding in. If you don't make compost tea, you should definitely be trying that. It's just about the whole theory of like a full parking lot, basically, you know, and maybe some of those parking lots happen to be Stephen King cars that eat other cars, you know, but mostly it's just a full parking lot. And there's no room for those spores to get established, you know. 
And that basically is the spray routine. Um, you know, I, I don't know that there's much more to say about it. Um, we spray a lot to keep our tomatoes going here, you know. Um, and we should be spraying more. You know, we shouldn't have had that missed time, you know. I actually want to see us doing more spraying, not less. Um, but I have heard tell, and Robin, who has, um, I always forget her, her last name, but she does Frog Holler. If you ever seen those ads, if you're on that email list. Robin Cammer. Cammer, yeah. She claims that she's just used her very diverse, um, what does she call it now? She calls it soil when she found out that she shouldn't call it compost because she might get regulated. So she calls it soil. <laughs> but it's essentially compost, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but she thinks that's soil and using equisetum, which is the biodynamic way. Equisetum is um, that plant that's very primitive, also known as horsetail, and it has tons of silica. And so that's a technique. And also Michael Phillip talks about, talks about using um, stinging nettle when it is in flower. It's got tons of silica. And that silica has a fungicidal effect. Mm. Different theories as to why. The um, biodynamic theory is that it acts like a million mirrors and amps up the light. And the light is, fungi don't like light, you know. But I'm not really sure why, but they say it does work. I've been meaning to try equisetum here for a couple of years. My problem is that you got to cook it. And that means I'm going to be doing it at night. I just never remember. I come home, I'm tired. It's like, oh, I'm supposed to put a pot of equisetum on. I can't eat it. I'm just not too likely to do it, you know. But I got to get disciplined and make that equisetum on, 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 the, on the clock, you know, not try to squeeze it in at night and try it because apparently it is effective. And she claims just using equisetum and her good, her, her good soil, she has not had late blight. So next year, I'm going to do that trial. You know, I'm going to absolutely try that, you know. Every year, I'm trying different things. Blight is one of those, you know, one of those ones that, I just am not going to give up. I want my heirloom tomatoes. I want those wonderful tomatoes. You know? um, and of course, it's also a very profitable crop if you can get it to come in. If you can grow organic tomatoes, you can make some money on it. You know? um, OK, any questions about, the, about that stuff now? Do you fertigate? We do, yeah. We fertigate. We're going to be fertigating a lot more when we have completed our new irrigation system. What do you use? We tend to use compost tea, fish, and seaweed. We use maxi crop. We use the browns, um, trout. Oh, that's it's been great. hydrolysate. Yeah, too. that's a great deal, by the way. If people don't know about it, I can give you the phone number. Yeah. Do you know about browns? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a great deal. It's I know. <laughs> okay. Browns. Well, see, and they actually now sell it at fifth season. I don't know if it's yeah. a great deal anymore, but it's a local product that's made from trout. It's not. It's not emulsion. It's hydroslate. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Hydrolate. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's cold processed and there's all these nutrients in it and so it's feeding the life on the plant and helping them maybe to kick the, um, the uh, acquired systemic immune response in. At least Michael Phillips thinks that it does and I'm going to be trying that. So we use that and we use, they, since they don't do a seaweed version, we bought maxi crop. You know, we make our own maxi crop. You know, a little bit goes a real long way. Keep it, it. We got it from Seven Springs Farm. It comes in a... It kind of it reacts like instant coffee if you get humidity on it. Fifth season, you know? Fifth season very pro very likely does sell it. Yeah. Seven Springs Farm, aren't they in Virginia? They're in Virginia, but that's pretty small, so it wouldn't cost much to ship it. Okay. You know? And it's water soluble. It's water soluble, but it's also hydroscopic and it attracts water. Okay. So if you leave it open and it's humid, all of a sudden you have this rock of kind of slimy, gushy seaweed you can still use it but it's hard to work with yeah it's not available to the plant when it gets in that gel state well i think if you dissolve it again it will be right probably yeah but it's a lot of work it's just not stable it's not easy to dissolve and it's probably going to spoil i find it spoils when it gets like that so keep it dry so you, know. you fertigate using those three materials every week no no we probably oh. only fertigate a few times a year but, oh. but that's mostly because we don't like our fertigation system uh -huh. We're probably going to do it much more when we get our fertigation. Okay, but this is a new thing I just heard. Uh -huh. This is from Michigan State site. Jean Davis has um, offered this, right? Okay. She's recommending that we not give nitrogen to tomatoes after their, their initial you know, couple weeks of being planted mm -hmm. because it makes more foliar leaf growth and that allows more fungi in. Yeah. And, and not she, but that site is recommending that. And leaves are not as strong when they have a lot of nitrogen. So we're going to back off on the nitrogen next year. Hmm. You know, it's a little late this year, and we'll always use a little bit of fish because it works as a spreader sticker. Mm -hmm. we're, going to, we're not going to give the tomatoes much nitrogen unless we think they need them. If we start seeing yellowing, yeah. our fruit drop off, but we're going to be way more careful. We always thought, like, 
plenty of food is good. It's all about health. Eat good and be healthy. Yeah. But you can eat too much meat, you know. So, so what? Once a month, just to make it simple. I I'd play with it. Frankly, I don't I don't I don't want to give a formula. Before I would have said you know once a week would be great if you can do it. But now I'm having second thoughts. Okay. You know. Because I've been doing yeah. it once a week and I wonder. Yeah, I I'd, I'd back people, off on. Other people do. So. I'd back off. I try it twice a week now, see if they do better with disease, you know, and, you know, just, just Fish play with it. Fish emulsion is nitrogen? Fish emulsion, um, and see, I'm actually recommending the browns, which is fish hydros hydrolysate. Hydro hydrolysate, fish hydrolysate. But it's yeah. nitrogen. It's, it's nitrogen, but it's also phosphorus, you know, it's also phosphorus. I don't think there's potassium in that, right? If I'm, am I right about that? It basically, it's a zero on potassium, right? It's a one. Oh, it's a one on potassium. Okay, it's like a two or three or four on, on phosphorus. It's a two on phosphorus. Two on phosphorus, and then four on. Is it four on nitrogen? Three. Three. Okay. Yeah. So it's three to one. Uh, yeah. Um, so it's got all of them, okay. you know, and actually in a pretty good balance for what we need. Okay. So the tomatoes do like their potassium. No, it's two, three, one. Two, three, two, one. Two, three, one. Two, three, now, three, one. The last thing, Epsom salt. That's a big thing. For that'll, magnesium. Yeah, that'll yeah. make your tomatoes grow better. How often should I use that? I do. Do a soil test and see how much magnesium you need. Mm. You know, that's just it. That's a, there's a folk idea to use it all the time. Yeah. But if you don't need magnesium, uh -huh. you are going to make it so that you can't access calcium by putting too much magnesium in there. Oh, interesting. You know, so you got to be careful about that. So, okay. you want to basically, if you get if you get your test back, uh -huh. the proportion you want to have is like. Um, you know, there's a base saturation, right, and a cation exchange capacity. That's if you get a soil test, right? Yeah. They give you a measure of how well the soil holds nutrients that are available to plants. Basically, it's how well there's negative charges that these base nutrients, right, like calcium and potassium and magnesium, right, they're going to be attracted to these negative charges or whatever. But you know, the negative part. So you want to have a base saturation that's pretty darn saturated, but you want to have some room if you need to make an adjustment. Mm -hmm. But in that base saturation, you want like 65 to like the high, the high 60s calcium, and then the high teens to the low 20s, like 1921 magnesium, and then the rest, right? Because that's most of it. The rest is the other minerals. You don't want to have like, you know, 40 or 50 calcium and 25, 30 magnesium, that's in balance. Yeah. You got to find a way to raise your cation exchange capacity and get more calcium in there. Okay, I know what yeah. you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? It doesn't have to, too, by the way. If you're a home gardener, you may never pay attention to that, you know? Yeah. But um, well, when you get, when you if get you're trying to make money, it's sale. good to pay attention. Uh, that's A&L Laboratories in Virginia. Oh, they give you that information. So does the NC State. It's there on, it's on, oh, on the NC State one, too. Yeah. They have a, they have all those there. Okay. Yeah. So like 60s percent calcium and you're in what percent magnesium? Oh, great. It's, it's like the mid, at least the mid to the high 60s and then the high teens to the very low 20s, like 1921 on magnesium, you know. Um, and by the way, there are people that, that say that that's not as, you know, but it, it, it's basically, it's worked for me to follow that. I haven't ever proven it, it works that way. Mark Schoenbeck, who I really respect, got a SAIR grant to prove it and couldn't prove it in the mountains. Mm. And then people who he knew, Ron Morris and Brinkley Benson, went to the Acres Conference, and he's lucky he wasn't there because they would have lynched him. <laughs> and those guys are like, well, we know him, but we don't know why he says that, you know, because it is like religion out there that you do that kind of balancing, mm. you know. And it, for me, it works. And so I recommend it, but I can't guarantee that, it, that it's scientific, you know. But it seems like you have a good balance that way. If you have that balance, you don't get blossom and red. I know that, you know. So that counts for something. Um, I think we've covered any possible um, problem. And are people having wilt problems? Are you get anybody having problems with like uh, the tomato being killed by a problem in the soil? I did. I had two tomatoes die out of three hundred. That's not too bad. No, that's not too bad. Did you get them? Did you get them ID'd what the what the rot was? You want to do that. I said, boy, the tomato wilted, so I pulled it up and threw it. That's a good thing to do. But next time, uh -huh. dig it up, take uh -huh. it in an idea. Because you want to find out. If you have Phytophthora capsicea uh -huh. or any of the other really persistent soil rots, uh -huh. you want to know. Because then you might put something down like, um, what's the brand name? I'm trying to remember the brand name. The active ingredient is, um, oh, great. Just don't want to go out there. Um, 
the acronym beauty is trichoderma. It's a fungi that eats fungus. Okay. You know, or actinovate. It's another. It's a. It's a biological that. Yeah. You'll want to use those if you find you have the wrong kind of soil rot. Okay. Probably you just have such good soil diversity like us. It's not spreading. You know. Okay. So. Yeah. Say a little bit more about the wilt because I've had some that just like overnight they just look like they're just wilting. Okay. Yeah. That that could easily be verticillium. Do you grow verticillium resistant tomatoes? Okay. So. I just got taught that if you cut the tomato and put it in water, if it's fungi, there'll be like a, a, a milky, leaky, like this kind of exudate that comes out of the fungi. If it stays clear, it's not, it's not a fungal problem, you know? Because it could be that you had voles eating the roots, you know? Did you check to see for mechanical damage? Because if you, if you see something rot, like wilting, we learned this big time in the orchard workshop. First thing you do is go poke around the base of the plant there's a lot of tunnels. It's just a vol, yeah. you know. So it could have been that, you know. But if it's actually got a, a fungal disease, there'll be that. Like when you put it in water, clear water, there'll be this exudate. That I think it's milky, but it might be brown. I forget. But I got. I learned this from our extension agent, um, Craig. He's really great. He will always use organic if he can, you know. So that's an easy way to tell. But if it's fungal, then you want to ID it, you know. If it's verticillium, an easy solution is to grow verticillium reducing, re resistant ones or fusarium. But if it's these new nasty ones, and I've been trying to pull up, can somebody help me? Does anybody else know the, um, the organisms that usually cause um, damping off? Rhizoctonia is one of them. Does anybody know what the other one is? It begins with an A, I'm pretty sure, but I just can't pull it up. You know, it's one of those, it's in the file drawer, the file drawer is too full. I know what's going to happen tonight as I'm going to bed, I'll go. You know? <laughs> yeah. But I've been trying to pull it up since I was making this outline, and I can't pull it up. We have it in the greenhouse. You know? It's one of our um, soil rots, and it's pretty bad. I don't think it's as bad as um, for top for capsici, but it's pretty bad. You know? So our solution is that, that diversity, using our teas and stuff, but also using this actinovate or trichoderma to control it. You know? That is pretty much it. Should we make a run for it? Take a look and see what we can see. Yeah. Do you Let's have the problems with nematodes here. Like no, it's it's only where it's hotter. Yeah, and there are things you can do for that. There's a marigold you can grow. Only one marigold is worth growing in the garden. It's big and tall and not pretty, but smells really nice. Oh, you mean all those little ones are? I think it's African. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're not good for getting rid of bugs. That's another talk, but they don't do anything. Okay. They're, the theory is they smell so bad the bugs can't find them. When bugs are hungry, they go past the smell. You know. If you're, if you're not hungry, you may not eat next to something that stinks, but if you're starving, you're not going to care. Pat, is you there know? any other companion plants that are beneficial in the, in the tomato? With people say fava beans, yeah. following after fava beans. People say basil. I can't, I have, I can't say that I've proved that. You know? uh, definitely, um, it's been proven that if you grow vetch and rye, but lots of vetch in particular, and then mow it and plant through it, that the tomatoes produce more. Wow. So I think it's just the nitrogen, but it's also probably the soil health, you know. Yes. But that was a big rage in the 90s. Some guy did research and everybody was talking about it. It was a real big deal. Okay, let's just, we're going to look real quick. I don't even want to get too close because I don't want to spread disease, but I want you to see it, okay? Look at those tomatoes there, right? And look at these. Big difference, right? These are defiant. These are defiant and as you get further along here, you can see they've had a lot of damage, but they're still producing just fine. So then the next ones, um, and the closer they get to, uh, and see, this is actually uh, something too. And I could, if we had more time, I'd tell you about a, t a, a SARE grant we did. But as you get here, where there are resistant tomatoes growing next to it, this one has virtually no damage. Down there, where they're growing next to infected tomatoes, yeah. they're much more damaged. But these are Mountain Magic. Uh -huh. And Mountain Magic and Defiant are probably the two most blight resistant tomatoes you can grow. That's great. You know? every, every commercial grower, do you grow Mountain Magic? We just uh, spared ourselves the trouble this year on tomatoes. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. Going yeah. A little more conservative. Uh huh. I understand. But if you're going to grow two tomatoes, it's probably and then the third one would be Plum Regal. They're the ones that we found have been the most resistant of all the tomatoes we grow. Awesome. But what's you know? the taste on the defiant and? The key is to get them dead ripe. Wait you know? till one rots. They yeah. Wait till one. That's it. You, if you pick them all at the same time, they're all about the same ripe, ripe, ripeness. Wait till they're just on the edge of rotting, and then they taste like a darn good tomato. They're not an heirloom, you know, but they do taste like a tomato. They're worth eating, you know. Um, if you eat them before that, they taste like store tomatoes, which in my case, why waste your time, you know? I don't bother. 
So that's them. Let's look. Let's go down here. Next row is Mount. This is all Mountain Merritt here, right? And then we get down here, and just like I thought, this is Mountain Fresh Plus. So Mountain Fresh Plus is actually somewhat resistant in a greenhouse, but no real resistance. Mountain Merritt is actually going to give us some, some tomatoes, you know. So, and, but not nearly as good, really, for us, the ones that are really good are the Defiant, the um, Plum Regal, and the Mountain Magic. But at least there are some tomatoes we'll get there. This here is a loss completely. This is Mountain Fresh Plus, which is a noted favorite tomato for conventional tomato growers and quite resistant to most diseases, but no real resistance to late blight. I'd say that's all we need to look at out here. Let's go to the greenhouse. See, unfortunately now it's, it's, it's night. We don't even have enough light for you to see. But these plants, we've had some wilts that have taken stuff out, but the plants do not have disease yeah, they look at all, fantastic. you know? Um, and that's because of the, all the pruning we're doing, you uh -huh. know, in order to get them to go up there, you know? Actually, that one's due to be tied up more. Uh -huh. But then, see, we can keep lowering them down. I'll walk up so that you guys can walk in. Yeah, one of them is a new one from Johnny's called something like Tinamura or something like that. Huh. Um, we also have Mountain Merritt in here. Uh -huh. um, we we also did Mountain Fresh Plus, but it would be one of the, it'd be those low ones over there, uh -huh. and they're showing more disease actually. You know, they're mostly the same old any any of the NC State indeterminates are in here. You know, and then also there's a potato leaf in here someplace, uh -huh. and that is Prudence Purple. You know, huh. I'd have to walk through and see it, but. The main point of coming in here is to show you that kind of trellising system. And we can literally lower these guys and bury their stems, yep. you know. But so also, one liter. pardon? Just one liter, not two? Um, yeah, we're doing one liter. One yeah, we're doing one. We could do two, okay. you know. But the other key thing to see is that with no rain and this much pruning, virtually no disease. Yep. I mean, sh short of the, of the wilt, virtually no disease, yep. you know. That's the main thing to show you in here. We, like right here, we'll lower this again, and right along there, we'll lay that stem on the ground, we'll take all the leaves off, put soil over it, and everywhere you took a leaf off, there'll be roots, yeah. you know? It'll and so that just makes a stronger plant. It renews the plant. Back up here. Yeah. Not to mention, yeah. you get cool. more... More room to go up, yeah. We've yeah. lowered our cucumbers about 35 feet this year so far. Wow. Yeah, and we've gotten just like... Putting more stuff over? Yeah, huh. yeah. We're just piling stuff on top of them, That's yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. we got, I mean, the yield of the cucumbers is like... A, Blowing our minds. It's the first year we, we ever did it. Put that into practice. My yeah, it's incredible. Have yellow spots yeah. all over them. Yellow spots sounds like a virus. Or sounds like a virus to me. Probably. What were you going to say? I was going to say or a deficiency. Or a deficiency. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Are the leaves molted like kind of like mottled looking? Yeah, they're starting to get yellow. They'll probably die. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would. I, you know. Okay, so the one resource I didn't talk about enough. Uh -huh. Extension. I missed talking about extension. Mm -hmm. You don't just look at that and say they'll probably die. Take it in, you know. Yeah, okay. Ask for Craig, yeah. okay. you know. Craig probably Down will. Down here at the Mills River. One. No, call up the the Henderson County one and okay. ask for Craig. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Take I it to might him. Have his card. Yeah. Ask him to help you figure it out, you know. Okay. Um, because you want to know that disease. You can't do anything about a disease you don't know. Yeah. You have to ID it. No doctor should ever try and cure a disease they don't know what it is, yeah. you know. So do that for sure, you know. Okay, so extension, use extension, okay? Um, and then the last thing I'm going to say is to make compost tea on a small scale, which I think everybody here is on, um, basically go to a pet store, buy two of those little bubblers that have two ports, mm -hmm. try to get something that can encircle the bottom of the bucket. Mm -hmm. You usually have to weigh that bubbler down mm -hmm. on the bottom and put two of your ports into that bottom bubbler. Then get like a paint strainer bag at Lowe's. You can get like three of them for a couple bucks. Fill that with really good compost and maybe some seaweed, you know, some kelp meal, mm -hmm. and maybe some azomite or other kind of rock dust. Okay, suspend that in the water and put a, two of those ports bubbling in that. Use a couple of those little stones so it's bubbling right in it, right? Then put the water in there. Have the water be 72 degrees. If you can't keep it 72 degrees, use one of those fish tank warmers to keep it warm. Oh, okay. okay? And bubble it, right? If it's got chlorine in it, bubble it for like an hour or two before you put anything in there because the chlorine will kill the microbes. Mm -hmm. Then add about maybe a three quarters of a tablespoon of molasses, maybe a tablespoon of fish hydrolyslate. Mm -hmm. Did I say it right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, just for some reason, I have a hard time with that word. And um, just say browns. Browns, yeah. <laughs> and um, maybe some 
maxi crop seaweed and the liquid put those in there and if you're really trying to increase increase um, the fungi you might actually put some mashed up fruit hmm. some mashed up fruit in the two let that bubble and it'll smell like fish and seaweed when you put it in there because that stuff has a strong smell let it bubble till it no longer smells like that instead it'll smell like the healthy side of a stream that's probably about 24 hours you've got your tea oh, good. that's how to do it okay okay thank you um, that's it anybody that's crazy can come on over and see the great big bubbler yeah. you know i don't mean that you're crazy but it's going to be crazy to do this you know otherwise i'd say that's the class oh you know what <clears throat> anybody that's hungry we have two tomato tomato pies up there that meredith made for us to eat at the end so if you would like a snack that i taste it one it's very delicious so are the instructions for making the tea on your site on the website the, there is the um video yeah. it's, it's on the video so fertility systems one it's got the whole thing yeah 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 yeah, yeah. okay so you know if you guys don't eat that pie i'm gonna eat it all uh, thank you. <laughs>